just some uh, general housekeeping notes during the forum. The presentation is being recorded and will be posted on YouTube. If you wish to speak, please raise your hand and that will be acknowledged by our uh, administ uh, forum administrator. And please use the chat box to share any ideas or questions you may have as we go through the presentation. Certainly if um, there is uh, an accumulation of interesting questions, then we will be able to take some time during the presentation to, to try and reply to them. And that will be handled by Helena, our administrator with, with Gregor. Please switch off your microphones if, unless you're speaking, because that helps us with our connections. Uh, and similarly with your cameras, it, it just keeps the uh, keeps the uh, lines free. Thank you. Today's agenda is uh, I'm just going to give you a short update on where we are with Geary and uh, how we were how we came into being. And what the uh, our purpose is, and uh, and then I'll hand over to Gregor, and uh, we'll have a Q and A session at the end, uh, followed by a summary of the key ob observations. So uh, my name's Cliff Smith. Uh, I'm the executive director of Geary. I'm sure uh, you will all have heard of the very sad passing of Tom Barton uh, some weeks ago now. And uh, we've been running around trying to uh, do the best we can to keep the momentum going. Initially, Geary uh, carried out research uh, funded by a number of uh, senior members of the construction industry. And uh, we, we were able to um, get a uh, feedback that showed that uh, wasted spend on error was in the region of 20% of total GDP of the construction industry. Uh, this diagram uh, was particularly pertinent when we were part of the research. The direct cost of error, that's the, the, the error itself, indirect cost because other people involved in the process get affected when error occurs. Unrecorded process waste, this is where errors are occurring, but they're not identified, uh, they're probably corrected and there's no record, specific record of that taking place. And then of course we have latent defects, which uh, unfortunately we're all familiar with, which occur after a project's been handed over. So it, it's, it's a bit like an iceberg, that you're only seeing the tip of the problem by seeing the error itself. And there is uh, a considerable amount of cost involved because uh, let's say the GDP of the construction industry is circa £100 billion a year, then we're talking about £20 billion of waste in every year as a consequence of error. What are the root causes? Well, our research showed these were the top 10 root causes of error. And what you can see is that it's planning and design, which tend to be uh, the most significant. Uh, inadequate supervisory skills was coming quite low down the list, but there's a lot of design issues, design changes, poorly communicated and incorrect design information, uh, ex but excessive commercial and financial and time pressures, it certainly features there and is a very important factor. So we've got to change, haven't we? 20 billion pounds a year of waste. Now that waste can is not just money, but the material cost, you, you know, we're all familiar now with the carbon initiatives that are taking place, well, waste, wasted, uh, materials through error contribute to that in a in a significant way. Now, Dame Judith Hackett, who was involved in the uh, Grenfell inquiry and is now driving through the Building Safety Bill, has said that any part of this sector who thinks they can survive by standing still or defending their current ter territory is sadly mistaken. 
Well, Geary believes that fundamentally we need to change to save this 20 billion pounds. It's virtually an eight, one HS2 a year. So our strategic aim at Geary is to improve construction productivity and quality by eliminating error. And as, you, as I've said, this has other spin-off benefits as well. And we'll be looking at those in due course. We've had a number of recent forums, checking procedures and how they impact on re reduction of error, behaviours, positive culture, and working with supply chain and materials. And these have all been well received and we've had some good positive feedback. And there's also a plan that we're developing now to have some more forums in the new year. These forums have been quite popular, I think, because we've all been stuck in our homes, um, but hopefully they will remain as popular when we get the chance to go back to some sort of semblance of normality. So I'm now going to hand on to Dr. Gregor Harvey, who's going to talk to you about better knowledge, meaning fewer errors. Thank you very much. So um, just bear with me for a moment while I try and share my screen with you. So hopefully you're all seeing my um, presentation slides there at the moment. Um, so I'm, I'm Gregor Harvey. I'm an architect and one of the founders of Designing Buildings Wiki. Uh, Designing Buildings Wiki, if you've not come across it, it's a free open access uh, wiki site for sharing construction knowledge. And it's used by uh, seven and a half million people a year. And that makes it the most popular construction industry website in the UK. Uh, today, I'm actually going to talk about my work as the chair of the Construction Knowledge Task Group and explain how the industry is getting its approach to knowledge pretty badly wrong, uh, meaning that more mistakes are made and productivity is lower than it should be. So I hope I'm going to demonstrate that knowledge is a bit of a blind spot for the industry at the moment, and the uh, consequences of that do matter. So just starting with the basics, uh, this is the knowledge pyramid. Um, so at the bottom, we've got data and data is just numbers and characters that uh, in themselves, they actually don't mean anything. Um, above that, we've got information. Information is data that's been structured so that it does have meaning. So a spreadsheet is uh, information. And then we've got knowledge, which is information that's been organized so it can be used. So for example, a, a spreadsheet, uh, sorry, a report would um, constitute knowledge. So it's information that's been organized. And then the application of that knowledge is wisdom. Uh, now, academics will argue all day about these definitions and which they should be and where the boundaries are between them. Um, so we came up with something we thought was a little bit simpler which is stuff that's published. So things that are published internally or externally. And very broadly, we're talking about this sort of thing. Um, so this is all clearly vitally important to the industry. Uh, this knowledge creates the framework within which the industry operates. Uh, it defines the standards of performance that are required from us. It tells us the best way to do things, what not to do, it helps us ensure compliance on projects and it helps us maintain our competence. So it's all crucial stuff. Um, but unfortunately, it's often pretty badly overlooked in the industry. And sometimes it's even uh, willfully ignored. And one of the problems with all of this stuff is that it generally sits between projects, not within them. So nobody has overall responsibility for it. So if you think back to data and information, data and information tend to be project based things. So they have clear authorship, they have authority, they have controls in place. Knowledge is generally not project based, it's industry wide. And it's published by a huge array of 
independent, often unrelated organizations, and they tend not to collaborate or coordinate particularly well. We, uh, a couple of years ago, we had a go at doing an organization chart for the construction industry, which was a bit of a, a brave thing to attempt. This is actually a, a bit out of date now, but you get the general idea, which is that it's complicated. So there's about nine government departments, more than 200 institutes and associations, uh, about 320,000 companies. And what is immediately apparent from it is it's not a pyramid. It's completely flat structure. There's no one at the top. Um, there's no overall controlling mind. So when it comes to knowledge, this means that if you ask who is responsible for best practice, for example, or why are there standards for some things and not others? Or where does policy come from? What gets researched? What doesn't get researched? There's no real clear answer to that. And that is becoming more of a problem because the sheer amount of stuff that we need to know, the amount of knowledge is going up. Just to give you one example, um, this is the increase in the number of British standards since the 1940s. Um, you can see that in the year 2000, there was something like 23,000 standards, which was a lot. But by 2014, so just 14 years later, this had gone up to 35,000, which is an extraordinary rate of growth. Oh, I've gone too far. Hang on, let me see if I can go back. Uh, believe it or not, this is how long standards last for before they're withdrawn. And it's gone down dramatically uh, from around 20 years in the 1970s to maybe just two years by 2014. So this ever-expanding and accelerating knowledge framework makes it harder and harder for us to keep up. So the scope for error is increasing. In 2017, we had a go at analysing some of the data generated by Designing Buildings Wiki uh, to assess whether industry knowledge is actually doing what it's meant to anymore. So we crunched a lot of numbers and came up with this heat map. Um, and the hotspots on this map show the subjects people write about and the relationships between them. So you can see there's lots of traditional academic subjects in the hotspots. So things like theory, research, innovation, case studies, news, uh, as well as products and design. And these are the things that traditional authors are comfortable writing about. It's what they know. Then we compared that with what people read about. And it's a completely different picture. People don't want that traditional academic knowledge. They want to know how to do things, basically. So they want to know about contracts, payments, appointments, construction management, all the practical stuff that you, you need on projects. The authors aren't comfortable writing about those things because they generally don't have much practical experience. So just running through that again, that's what people write about, what people read about. So you begin to get a picture that maybe the knowledge framework that we have in place at the moment isn't really serving the industry brilliantly well. Oh, I've jumped two slides again. Let me go back. In 2018, we ran some workshops to see if anyone else recognised this problem and whether they wanted to do anything about it. And the overwhelming response was yes. So we set up a construction knowledge task group. Uh, this is the membership of it at the moment. And we began by running an industry-wide survey that had about 300 respondents. So the first thing this confirmed was what sort of knowledge people are looking for. Um, and as in our own data, it tends to be practical things about how to do stuff rather than more general academic knowledge. So it's technical guidance, design guidance, 
codes, policy, that sort of thing. Um, not so much the traditional things like case law, research. They are less popular across the industry. We also found some interesting disparities between the professions. So um, engineers, for example, access knowledge three to four times a day. Um, you compare that with project managers, they only access knowledge once or twice a day. And overall, and I, I guess it's not that surprising, but it tends to be designers that make the greatest use of knowledge. The most startling thing we found was this, uh, which is more than a third of practitioners will freely admit they don't have easy access to the knowledge they need to do their job, which is a bit concerning. So if they don't have access to the knowledge they need, uh, what are they doing instead, is the question. And this must be resulting in significant errors, missed opportunities, um, and it's something we really ought to be doing something about as a matter of urgency. The reasons they don't access knowledge are um, also a bit concerning. So just not being aware of what's out there is a real problem. There's just so much knowledge. But time and money are also a problem, particularly for SMEs that make up the vast majority of the industry. So, I mean, to give just one example, if you take approved document B, um, which is a free to access document, whilst it itself might be free, it refers to about 100 British standards. And just one of those, so BS9999, costs more than 400 pounds, and it's more than 400 pages long. So if you multiply that by 100 British standards, and that's just for approved document B, you have to ask, do we actually believe that SMEs are buying and reading and complying with all the requirements we're throwing at them? Or is it actually just becoming a tick box exercise where we list knowledge resources in specifications, but we don't really have any expectation that anybody's actually going to read them? So not only is there a huge amount of very expensive knowledge, but it isn't always clear who's responsible for applying it, particularly in a long supply chain. Um, so you only have to have listened to some of the Grenfell Tower inquiry testimony in the last um, couple of months to realise that the industry is actually full of people who do not understand what they're responsible for. Part of the problem is that we've made it uh, difficult and time consuming and expensive for practitioners to find and access the knowledge they need. Um, so even when companies do have corporate subscriptions to all the knowledge that they need, and they have their own internal uh, knowledge management systems, they tell us that people don't use them. And that's because there are too many different platforms to search. They have to sign in and out of all of these different platforms. It's too complicated to find things, and so they just don't bother. And known and reported errors are repeated, even things on their own in, internal internets, uh, um, repeated errors. And known innovations are not adopted. So instead, a large part of the industry is using easy, cheap, and by cheap I mean free, um, but often less authoritative knowledge sources, or they're using nothing at all. So Google, as a knowledge source, is used five times as much as the institutes that uh, we're all members of. And that probably isn't a good idea. And practitioners are doing this even though they trust these sources of knowledge less. So you can see on this graph at the top left um, is the knowledge that people trust, but they use it less often. And the bottom right is knowledge that they don't trust so much, but they use it more often. So they know they don't trust it, and they know they're taking risks, but they do it anyway.
So why does it matter? I mean, Cliff was talking about the, the cost of um, error to the industry. So I think it's about 21%, which is a lot of money. Um, the IPA has identified a £15 billion pound productivity gap. So these are big, big numbers. And of course, the Hackett Review recently has been criticising the industry for its competence levels. And all of those things really, to a certain extent, are about the dissemination and the acquisition and the application of knowledge. So this, this knowledge problem is a little bit perplexing because the industry has made huge strides in modernising its data and information. So we've got things like the rollout of BIM and the emerging digital twins. We've got smart buildings and sensors. Somehow knowledge has been left behind um, in that transformation. So it's been almost entirely overlooked. So the Construction Knowledge Task Group has created this route map for change, uh, which we based very, very loosely on the BIM uh, maturity levels. So level zero knowledge is basically paper documents sitting on shelves. Level one, which is pretty much where we are now, is dumb digital versions of paper documents. Um, so basically PDFs and websites. Um, so in terms of BIM, this is like the old CAD drawings where CAD drawings were just digital versions of paper drawings. So that, that's where we are at the moment. Level two, uh, which is where we need to get to next, is a bit like BIM level two. So it's knowledge that has a standard class classification system. So it's interoperable and it can be easily accessed and searched and managed and collaborated on uh, whatever, whatever its source. Ultimately, we need to get to level three. Um, level three with calling smart knowledge, uh, where we can check that people have access to critical knowledge. Uh, we can give them access to it if they don't. And we can push knowledge to them when they need it. So we will no longer be reliant on people happening to realise that there's something they need to know and then bothering to do something about it. We've, and we put, Gregor, we've got a question. I don't know if you want oh yeah. to answer it at this sure. stage. Go ahead. Um, um, somebody's asked, uh, where is the research that supports that internet searches are increasing risk and based on your chart and that people have little faith in what they find in search engines, but they use it anyway? Uh, this would be useful to know the supporting evidence to help with transformational business cases. Yeah, so uh, that graph wasn't something we just made up. That is a um, that's a piece of maths, and it is based on three hundred survey responses. Um, so we asked them which which sources of knowledge they used, and how frequently they used them, and how much they trusted them, um, and that is the graph that comes out of that um, that data. Did you want to respond to that? Or... Yes, so uh, thank you for that. Can that data be made available or shared uh, with those on this call? Is that is that something that can be shared? Um, yeah, it's shareable. Um, it, it's in a quite complicated format, but uh, yeah, we can make that available as a spreadsheet. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, so we put together a route map of how we get from where we are now to where we need to go. Um, and that's a long journey. If you, if you think about the BIM journey, the BIM journey has been eight years so far. Um, and knowledge is a long, long way behind that. Uh, but actually, the first step is now complete. Um, so we have developed a standard classification system for construction knowledge. Uh, that is called the Specification for Discoverable Construction Knowledge. It was prepared by the Construction Knowledge Task Group uh, with the help of a company called Barbell. And that was um, funded by the 
Open Data Institute and Lloyd's Register. So Lloyd's Register see this as a safety critical issue. So the, the specification for discoverable construction knowledge is freely available. And it gives the industry for the first time a consistent way of describing its knowledge. So it's easy to search, filter, and manage across multiple sources. So I would encourage all of you, if you're producing knowledge of any sort, even if it's in-house knowledge, please start adopting this standard uh, rather than inventing your own system. The next step that we're just embarking on is to develop some tools that begin to access and manipulate the knowledge that complies with this standard. So I'm going to attempt to show you a couple of examples of things that um, will give you a vague idea of the sort of thing that might be possible. I have to stress that these are very, very rough and ready tools at the moment. They're just quick experiments to assess options, but um, you might begin to get the idea of what we're looking at. So hopefully this will work. This is a very, very simple search engine that we put together that um, only searches 60 key industry knowledge sources and nothing else. So it's only searching construction knowledge. So it's a really simple tool, but if I um, search for timber structure, for example, hopefully this will work. Google was broken a bit earlier. I don't know if anyone noticed that, but it's, it's back now. The whole of Google throughout the world. Um, so this is search on our, our search engine and it comes on, we come top, I apologize for that. Uh, but if you look at the, the results that come up, you get um, Taylor and Francis, um, Trada, iStruct-T, um, a pretty good combination of industry sources, MBS there. It's gonna give you um, some very useful practical industry knowledge about timber structures. Now, if I compare that with just an ordinary Google search, which hopefully will work. So you see we're getting Pinterest, we're getting um, product manufacturers, Getting us again there, I apologize for that, DZine. Um, so it's, you're still getting things about timber structures, but it's a lot more general. It's more um, consumer orientated. It's more uh, aimed at the general population and doesn't give you the helpful sort of technical stuff that you get with a more focused search. So what we've done, it's a very simple tool. It's, it's available on Designing Buildings Wiki. You can try it out. Um, but if you imagine now with the knowledge standard, what we'll be able to do is to own this tool down. So you'll be able to search for things, not just by the subject, but also by the type of knowledge that you're looking for, by the publisher, by the date and so on. So you would, for example, you'd be able to search for the latest research about timber structures or the latest news or upcoming events or CPD. Um, so that once the standard has been adopted, something like this starts to become really, really quite powerful. The other thing that we started to look at is um, taking knowledge to people rather than expecting them to go and find it. Um, so we created a little pop-up for the Firefox browser. And what this does is it looks things up on Designing Buildings Wiki from any website. So any website in the world, you can use this. So we're on the, this is the Gary website. Um, and say you're on this and you, you just come from out of space and you didn't know what COVID-19 was. If you just highlight that. Oh. A little window pops up explaining it all to you and giving you some construction industry um, knowledge about that. Um, maybe if you didn't know what latent defects were, again, a little window just pops up explaining it to you. 
Um, or maybe you haven't heard of Giri. So then the other thing that this does is if you were to search for something that there isn't a match for, so if we search for errors and there is no match, direct match for errors. So it will give you some closest subjects to it. Um, but it also asks you if you want to create that page. So there's no page on error at the moment. If we click on that link, the page gets created and we could start writing a new article about error now. So that is available as a little trial tool on the uh, Firefox add-ons. It's called uh, Designing Buildings Anywhere. And at the moment, it just searches Designing Buildings Wiki. But again, you can imagine that once the standard has been adopted, this could um, look through all construction industry knowledge. And again, you'd be able to filter it. So you might be able to look for just research or just news or what's the latest legislation about latent defects or is any research about COVID-19. Um, so it will become a lot more powerful. And this is taking knowledge to where people are rather than expecting them to go to look for it. And again, you can imagine this being developed for um, the project environment. So uh, say you're working in Revit, there could be a, a knowledge plugin for Revit. So if you're working on an object within your model, you could click on that object and um, it would pull up the latest guidance, the latest best practice, the latest legislation news about that product, uh, the object that you're, you're working on. So it's very, very early days, but you begin to get a sense of how we start to handle knowledge as a resource that we can manipulate rather than a thing that we have to go and look for. And I'm sure you're all familiar with um, the concept of the, the knowledge graph, which is the right hand bar. If you do a Google search now, um, Google will create a little bit of knowledge all by itself automatically on the right hand side and um, that pulls together knowledge from a whole different range of sources into a single frame. Um, so there's an automatically generated knowledge graph here about the Eiffel Tower. Well, when the construction knowledge standard has been adopted throughout the industry, you'd be able to do this with construction knowledge. So you'd be able to pull together resources about any subject automatically. So what can you do? Um, and what is the take home out of this? I guess uh, the survey information that we've compiled and also the anecdotal feedback we've had has made it clear that simply referring to knowledge in project documentation does not mean it's going to be used. So if you want to be certain of that, you need to check. And this applies within your own organization as well as it does across projects and supply chains. The fact that you have um, put knowledge references in the specification or on your own internal intranet does not mean people are using it. We need to change that culture if we want to reduce errors and improve productivity. Um, but the one take home thing is you actually need to check. You can't just count on it because you've written it down. Sharing knowledge um, is another way that you can help. So your practitioners, um, you are the only ones with practical experience. So please write up your lessons learned, write up your successes, write your failures, write up ideas and best practice. Uh, they do not have to be traditional long essays. In fact, if they're long essays, people won't read them because they don't have time. What the industry is looking for is short, sharp, to the point, practical information. So it might just be a paragraph. In some cases, it might just be a sentence. But that is what the industry is craving, but not getting. Practical stuff that it can use. And it's something only you can write. So marketing teams and press offices and academic authors can't do it. They don't have the experience. So you can share knowledge internally, you can share it externally, 
Um, you can do it on Design and Buildings Wiki for free. Um, I'm sure there are other forums available. And also adopt the new standard. If you publish things internally or externally, start to make them consistent with the rest of the industry by adopting the standard in exactly the same way as you do now with um, your data and information in uh, BIM. So we can then begin to bring knowledge up to the same standard as data and information and begin to cut out some of the avoidable errors and to adopt more of the innovations that are available. So uh, just finally to say we've got a lot of institutes and publishers involved in the construction knowledge task group. Uh, we need more consultants, we need more contractors, we need more suppliers, so we need more people from the coalface, more practitioners. And um, if you want to get involved in this work, please do email me, that's my email address on the screen. Um, even if you just want to be kept informed about what's going on, um, let me know. Um, so that's it for me. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Um, should we invite questions? If anyone's got questions, uh, we can take them either in the chat box or you can um, unmute yourself and ask if you've got a burning question and uh, Gregor will respond. So uh, we'll give you a, a couple of minutes to think about it. Is there um, any examples of you where the specification has been used to create knowledge case studies where they can be accessed? So, you know, is there like a good 10 or more examples um, that are using that specification layout specifically? Because obviously one of the issues is, is when trying to capture knowledge, when it's captured in all different types of formats and case studies, people kind of lose the will to live just to try and understand how it's been structured. So if there is a, a specific outline contained within that specification, it would be good to also have examples with it. Um, so the, the specification is it's relatively new, so um, it, it's just in the process of being adopted at the moment. There is a, a um, category that we've called examples rather than case studies because we're trying to um, we're trying to adopt uh, ways of describing things that the internet understands, search engines understand. Um, so, so there is a category for that. Um, we don't have a template for how to do them. Um, we, we've tried developing templates for people in the past. And in, I think it's the way, the only way you can get them adopted is by putting them into people's job descriptions or putting them into actual contract documentation. So if you commission a case study, for example, you have to make it part of the commissioning documents that somebody complies with a particular way of um, laying something out or describing something. But I think my, the, the short way, the short answer is that People don't want great long templates filled out with millions of bits of information. They want the facts, you know, and a fact might just be a sentence. So it's more about writing something very, very clearly that is the answer to a question. You've got to imagine what questions are people asking? You know, what are they Googling, essentially? Or what are they saying to Alexa? And we need to be answering those questions. So if we're not answering them, somebody else is. Just a very quick example, a couple of years ago, we made the mistake of Googling which way up do you lay a brick. And the, um, the range of answers that you found on the internet were horrifying. Given that the answer is known, it's, you know, it's not a secret which way up you should lay a brick. But there are all sorts of forums arguing about which way up they should be, and maybe they should be frog face up on the first floor and then frog face down above that. Or I mean, it's utterly ridiculous. And we've now written an article which clarifies it. Um, but yeah, it's answering questions clearly is what it's all about. I think I think it's just being absolutely clear on how you do that. You know, answering something clearly is quite 
open to interpretation because one, one of the issues is like on the BIM side of things, for example, where we write a lot of knowledge resources and guidances is, is, is trying to lay it out in a structure or a standardized structure so that search engines can search for it. So, for example, you know, there's a lot of knowledge uh, resources out there at the moment that just have a, a box just for keywords. You know what I mean? And then search yeah. engines, including Design Wiki, are able to search for key, just the keywords, and that's what it uses when you search up, you know, um, timber specification or something like that. So it's 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 having that because when when I've looked at a lot of, you know, somebody writes something up saying this is what we learnt on this project when laying down bricks, for example, you know, the way that it's written makes it very difficult to then search for later. And I, I find that, that that is the, the principal problem, because no matter how well they go into it, how brief or how to the point, if you can't find what you need, if, if the tools that you use can't search the, the contents within, it's usually lost, you know, because hundreds, if not thousands of these can get produced if you put a lot of effort into it. So there's got to be a way of, of being able to categorize these in some way and structuring them in a standardized way. Otherwise, one will always trump another. Yeah, so I mean, a part of the specif the purpose of the specification is to make that easier to do, not in terms of what you've written within the actual um, piece of knowledge, but in terms of finding it. So there are all sorts of ways of classifying. I think we've got something like 30 different things that you can classify according to. Um, and one of them, it was, I think two, two of them we've taken from Uniclass. So we, we've tried not to invent new things. We've used existing systems. Um, but I think we use Uniclass for the sector that the knowledge is about, um, and also for the um, the sort of the part of the building or the part of the asset. So it it should make it a lot easier to focus down specifically on what you're looking for. Um, so it's a combination of things. It's a combination of telling a search engine enough information so that it knows what your knowledge is about and then writing it in a way that is easy for people to get the takeaways from rather than having to wade through you know we produce 100 page pdfs still i mean it's just crazy as, as if people are going to print them out and they're these dumb formats that you can't even copy and paste from it's just this bonkers it's like we you know that's we did that with drawings 20 years ago but we've moved on um so we've got to stop doing knowledge that way and start doing it in a way that basically machines get because if the machine doesn't get it are they going to find it yeah thank you um I think we've got some more questions. One from uh, Cliff. I think you had your hand up first. Yeah, Gregor, <clears throat> there was a graph which showed the t time that standards last for, and it yeah. seemed to be dropping. <coughs> Excuse me. So uh, I'm just trying to get my brain around it. So we're producing a lot more standards, but they only last for a couple of years now, whereas they used to last 20 years. Is that what we're saying? Yeah, the, the industry has accelerated and standards actually don't last very long anymore before they're withdrawn and replaced and some, you know, they're superseded, there's a new one produced. Um, so your, your knowledge has, you know, is, it's increasingly ne necessary to keep, keep on keeping up to date because things are going out of date so quickly. I mean, we could rely on the, the concrete specification back when I was doing design of concrete buildings you know you, the big change was going from you know a euro from a british standard to a euro standard but are we saying that the changes in the information are even more um you know they're, they're so big that you've got to be constantly updated uh that is the implication of it yeah um which is a bit of a problem, particularly for smaller organizations, organizations. I mean, it's great if you're Arab, you know, and you've got a specialist in everything. But if you're a smaller company and you don't have that luxury, keeping on top of this stuff is very hard. So, you know, we write about these things all the time. We write about all of the changes. We write about changes in standards. And, you know, even for us, it's very, very hard to keep up. And, 
you know, there is an argument about it's a brilliant business model for the British Standards Institute. Um, you know, if there's critical knowledge that the industry needs to know for safety reasons, is it a good idea that we're charging people to get access to that? You know, we looked at producing British standards um, for something else ourselves a few years ago, and I think it was going to cost on the order of £60,000 to produce a pass. Uh, and then people get charged for buying it as well. So uh, is this the right way of disseminating knowledge to people? I mean, approved document B referring to 100 British standards. That means that approved document B in itself is almost worthless because it you, you need other things that you have to pay for, a lot of other things that you have to be able to pay for in order to understand what it actually requires. It's hard work. Yeah. Okay. So, got on. Sorry, did you want to carry on? No, I was just saying carry on. <laughs> yeah, um, I've got a question. Um, experience from the coalface may not be valid knowledge. Any thoughts on the need to verify? No, I think this is one of the things that practitioners always say is that, you know, we, we struggle always to try and get people to write anything about anything. And you can talk to very experienced professionals and you say, well, surely, you know, if you just wrote a bit, they'll tell you things in the pub about their experiences and what they've learned and how to do things. We say, well, you know, could you just write that up? Or write a paragraph, write a, write a few sentences about things that you've learned. Say, oh, no, I, I don't know anything. I'm not an expert. And you think, well, you are an expert and you do know something. That's what you get paid for. And the People wouldn't go into a client meeting and say, oh, no, I don't know anything. Of course you do. You're all experts. And I know it can be putting yourself out there a bit to write something down. Um, but you get over that quite quickly. Um, so, you know, I've written a huge number of articles. And you start out imagining that you're going to get tremendous criticism for doing it. But you don't. All you get is gratitude from people that you've helped. Because there's always going to be somebody that knows less than you do and um, we'll be grateful for being helped out and saved from making a mistake. Did, uh, did you want to come back on that, the person who um, put the question in there? Steve, was it, I think? Um, yes, um, yeah, I, 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 I see the point on that. And, and um, yeah, perhaps all experience is good experience, um, but if, if, uh, the person who's offered that experience um, has, I don't know, he, he, he's, he's just got it wrong, um, but he's putting it out there as if it were gospel or if it had been uh, validated. Uh, I don't know. I, I wonder if that's that's misleading or or perhaps in a in maybe in a health and safety setting is is actually dangerous. Um, I mean, on occasions where where I've been involved in writing up lessons learnt, um, you know, the difference between experience which has been subject to some kind of um, peer review or investigation, um, you know, to to consider the the wider context, I would regard as as very valuable knowledge. Uh, some anecdotal opinion, I I I would. I'd, I'd um, be a bit concerned as to how uh, how useful that that was. Yeah, I mean, I think you're you're absolutely right. I mean, clearly, uh, properly prepared, properly peer reviewed things written by respectable organisations are always going to be better. And the, there is a place for both. I think the difficulty at the moment is that we've made the authoritative stuff so difficult to access that people aren't accessing it. Whereas the things that you find on a Screwfix forum or on YouTube, which, you know, are people that have probably very little training, but aren't worried in the slightest about putting their knowledge out there, and will produce a YouTube video about just about anything, or write a long rant about which way up you should lay a brick. Those people are putting knowledge out there, and it's wrong. Whereas people that actually know the answers, like us, hopefully, 
we're, we're not, you know, the, the, the experienced practitioners in the industry are not putting knowledge out there. So you get this huge gulf opens up between the authoritative stuff that you often have to pay for or sign up for, and people are reluctant to do that, or it's hard to access. And the mess of things that are out there on YouTube and Screwfix forums that are written by God knows who. And there is a place in the middle there, either to make the authoritative stuff easier to access, which we hope we're going to be able to encourage people to do through the, the task group and the new specification, but also to fill that gap a bit, not leave it up to the idiots on YouTube, but for us to actually share what we know, because what we know is authoritative. So we, should, we just need to get it out there a bit more. Okay. I can't see any other questions from uh, from our um, audience, but I've got a question. Uh, just thinking about um, what you said about people finding it difficult to write, or yourself when you first start, you find it difficult. Have you got any thoughts on how um, we can encourage engineers and, and technicians who are generally not confident in communicating in writing? to improve that or, or or maybe they they may also if they work for a large organization they may also be slightly nervous of um what their pr people or their sort of corporate voice wants them to, to put out there yeah i think um when we've dealt with organizations what we've said is well so they are very nervous and they worry about being sued and they worry about their intellectual property and i'm never quite sure about intellectual property and construction because once you've built something you can see it anyway um but our advice has always been well do do one just take one thing that you're totally confident about and put it out there and see what happens and what happens is nothing people read it and are grateful and once they, they get over that, they're a lot more uh, happy to, to do it again, because it, it's only good, good publicity for them at the end of the day if people are accessing things that have got their, their company's name on it. I think in terms of individuals, you can actually start very, very um, simply. Um, you know, one of the things that we've started putting together is a list of acronyms, and you just can't believe the number of acronyms there are in the industry. I think we've got about three and a half thousand so far. Just listing the acronyms that you use so that other people can understand what you mean is a very useful thing. And it's very easy to do. Um, the other thing is definitions. What does something mean? And what does something mean is becoming more and more important because the industry is starting to engage with other sectors. So we're starting to engage more with the technology sector, with software developers. In modern methods of construction, we're engaging with factories. And when you work with somebody that's from a, a manufacturing background, they don't necessarily have the same understanding of words that we do, or the words might mean something else. So just defining things so that we all mean the same thing is something that we can all get together and do. And it will be a huge benefit to the industry. Let's all just at least mean the same thing when we say something. And that's not, you know, you don't have to be a brilliant writer to do that. And it's not something that people are going to get wrong or, or there might be multiple definitions for, for some things. Um, but that's, that's not time consuming. It's very easy to do and it's very, very helpful for other people. So start small. And once you realize nothing big happens, do something bigger. Okay, well, <clears throat> I think we've exhausted questions. And uh, so it just uh, falls to me, Gregor, to thank you very much indeed for speaking to us today. It's raised in my mind uh, more of the hopes I had when I was first uh, when I first met you a couple of years ago. It does seem things like things are moving along, and uh, certainly one of the research areas that uh, Giri are looking at is the effective communication of information to the workface. Um, the use of tools like the mobile phone and the pad and so forth, which are readily available uh, and getting inform the right information to put 
to people at the right time is definitely something we're all very conscious of to help avoid error. So uh, thank you to you, Greg, and thank you to those people who have uh, joined us today. I hope you found our forum useful and tell your friends and um, contribute to Designing Building Wiki if you feel it's um, appropriate. Thank you very much indeed.